UK national treasure and professional crotchety old bloke Michael Burke provoked outrage and even some nuanced discussion with a column arguing that obese people should be left alone. And if that means they die early, well that's fine because it means the National Health Service will save money. Controversial or common sense? Let's discuss. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Let's be clear. Obesity is a real issue. According to the National Health Service, currently 29% of adults are classified as obese, which is up from 26% in 2016. And that has consequences, with 10,660 hospital emissions directly attributed to obesity. Obesity can reduce your life expectancy by 8 to 20 years, higher risks of heart attacks, diabetes and a host of other problems. In recent years, we've seen a number of measures by the government to try to tackle the problem of obesity. For instance, the sugar tax. And campaigners are always calling for more penalties on any food that they believe to be unhealthy. New Prime Minister Boris Johnson is not a fan of so-called sin taxes. And now it seems neither is TV personality and journalist Michael Burke. Writing in the large circulation Radio Times, he said that couch potatoes should be left alone and allowed to make their own personal choices. Provide information for informed choice and nudge all you like, he says, but then leave them alone and let them take the consequences. He said, the obese will die a decade earlier than the rest of us. See it as a selfless sacrifice in the fight against demographic imbalance, overpopulation and climate change. He said people who were trying to classify obesity as a disease were just plain wrong. You're fat because you eat too much. He kicked back against claims that obese people cost the National Health Service £6.1 billion per year, saying who can calculate how much they would have cost if they were slim? How much would he or she cost if instead of keeling over with a heart attack at 52, they live to a ripe, dementia-ridden old age requiring decades of expensive care. Now, although the tone of his contribution was, shall we say, unique to him, quite a few people supported the basic message. Weight loss expert Steve Miller defended the comments on television, saying that there are no fat people in a famine. Ultimately, if you're fat, it's your choice. Others, as you would expect, have been outraged. Self-confessed fat writer Gillian Fisher took issue with his comments that fat people were weak, not ill. She accuses him of reinforcing the popular opinion that all fat people are lazy TV junkies with no interest ranging beyond the biscuit tin, which she describes as untrue and harmful. As a size 20 woman, she said, I often feel that my body is somehow public property. I've had complete strangers approach me to share their Weight Watchers stories. Fellow commuters tell me that walking would be better for me. And Tinder matches say they'd really like to sleep with me, but they wouldn't want their friends to know. It fails completely to address how challenging weight loss can be, especially if emotional issues or personal problems underlie your relationship with food, as is the case with me. I actually find that a really strange defence, because it doesn't seem to contradict what he said. In fact, really rather the opposite. Her piece was headed, I am fat but by no means weak. But then she implies that she wants to lose weight, but struggles with emotional issues and personal problems, which is kind of his point when he says weak not ill. Now it all depends if you see the use of that word as being a dismissive attack on people as having an irredeemable character flaw or whether it's simply a description of the process. So look, I'm on a diet right now. Third time I've done something like it. Only the first time had I allowed myself to become overweight, something like 15 years ago, and I went to buy some clothes and my size didn't fit. And my then wife said, well, you just have to accept that you're a different size now. <laughs> and that was like the red rag to the ball that I needed. But I was pretty damn sure I wasn't going to accept any such thing. So I did what I had to do, controlled the intake, did more exercise and successfully brought myself to my ideal BMI weight. When I look back at photos of myself then, I'm horrified at how I'd gotten. And I hadn't realised it at the time. When you change in tiny increments day by day, you don't see it. Once it's happened, 
you can learn the lesson. So since then, I watch my weight. And if it starts to drift up, I gently bring it back in line. So, Malin, you say, in that case, why are you on a diet? Because sometimes we human beings are susceptible to weakness. My general approach is that I try to keep my weight within seven pounds of my ideal BMI weight. But my absolute red line is if it approaches the threshold for overweight. That's what will trigger a diet. Focused, corrective action. And I just use an app where you control your weight loss goal. It gives you a calorie budget. You faithfully and completely record everything you eat or drink. You keep within the budget until you've achieved the goal. Works for me. Might work for you. I found over time that not everybody responds well to the same system. So you have to try things out until you find the things that work for you. However, the point is this. When I was in a time of weakness, I put on. When I was being disciplined and focused, I could take it off and then settle to a range where you can keep watch and then self-correct when necessary. So Michael Burke making the case that people should take personal responsibility and take the consequences for their own decisions instead of having the nanny state micromanaging everyone's lives. Well, that's an argument I have some sympathy with, even though I think it is a more nuanced position than the absolutists on either side would actually allow. Because that's what's prompted Burke into writing about it now. Not that there are more people getting fat, but that the government is becoming more interventionist to push us to do the right thing, whether we want to or not. The real question he poses is this. Government policy is predicated on the idea that we should be doing everything we can to keep people alive for as long as possible. We celebrate the fact that national life expectancy has gone up for so long. In fact, it's probably the rise of obesity that has caused that steady improvement to stall in the last couple of years. Now, like me, you probably sign up to your own longevity as a life goal that you would take personal responsibility for. And governments absolutely need to step in when there are wider factors that impact our health that are out of our hands. We expect governments to tackle companies polluting the environment and so therefore reducing our life expectancy. We expect governments to control crime and stop foreign despots from invading and design the roads to be safe to travel on and all of those things, things that are out of our hands. But where do we put the balance between the freedom of the individual to make their own life decisions and that wish to boost the overall longevity of the population? And I don't mean the gentle nudges and the public health information. I mean, I love the fact that chocolate company Cadbury recently announced that it would be putting a 100 calorie count limit on its chocolate bars to try and play its part. I think that's great. Setting the default choices in ways that make it easier not to get into trouble. That's the sort of thing I think that socially responsible food companies and governments can do. It's what Burke meant when he said nudging. But it's a very different thing to government telling you what's the approved way to live your life and then putting more and more muscle into punishing you if you transgress. The flip side of that is that if you allow yourself to become obese, you do take the consequences. You don't get to have everything you want without consequence. In fact, every choice has a downside of some sort. I mean, that's life, isn't it? So our fat writer who complains about everybody feeling like they can pass comment on her weight. That is universally something that happens to people that have gone past the threshold into obesity. Lots of them mean well. Some are just trolls. But it's very, very common. So you can whine about it all you like. It's one of the consequences. Along, of course, with the prospect of dying younger. And if it pisses you off enough, maybe that will be the motivation you need to fix it. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it. And of course, a lot of it is not fair. Some of the people don't share their Weight Watcher stories. They call you a fat cow and tell you you're ugly. And people who do that, of course, are despicable. Hopefully there are consequences to them of being an objectionable moron who says mean things to people. More seriously, there was a separate news story this week that some doctors are being tested with volunteers wearing fat suits 
to see how differently they treat obese people. Because studies have suggested that medical students treat patients differently who are obese, being judgmental about their condition and therefore giving them a poorer degree of care. Now, I think any professional body should train its people to give the same degree of care to all patients in that situation. Again, you can't control what people think about others, but a professional body can damn well insist that they don't allow such sentiments to affect how they behave. But it is a reflection of wider attitudes in modern society. We can whine about fat shaming all we like. And it's a wholly ineffective change strategy to address the fact that people do see it as the one prejudice that it's OK to have. Because you can't change if you're male or female, if you're black or white, if you're straight or gay. But you can change whether you're fat. And if you choose not to change that from a position of strength, cool. Live hard and die young, as the Hells Angels would agree. But accept that consequence as one of the consequences of your choice. If you do want to change it, but just can't, well, that's then about finding the sort of help that can make the difference. And there should be as much help on hand as we can muster. Human ingenuity is constantly working away at how we can help people to lose that weight, because it can be hard, particularly for those who are starting from the worst place. And it's worth noting that, as we've seen with a decline in smoking alongside the rise in vaping, sometimes a genuinely less harmful, attractive alternative is what's actually most helpful to break the pattern. But the arguments that say we should present positive body images to encourage people to think that morbid obesity is just fine is demonstrably not helping. If to do that, you're pretending that those consequences don't follow. And I feel this really personally. Many years ago, I had an obese cousin whose child had a really tough upbringing because her mother simply keeled over and died when she was five years old. I have a good friend who found his life partner and they had the most fantastic partnership, but gave each other permission to balloon to become morbidly obese. And he has been mourning her for a decade since she tragically died young of diabetes. These are desperate personal tragedies. It's just not obvious that it's in our control to prevent or that the price of doing so, if it means governments controlling people, doesn't have equally bad consequences. There is one area that's different. The one aspect that, according to the write-ups anyway, Burke doesn't go into. And that's specifically childhood obesity. Because raising your kids to be fat isn't about free choice. It's about training your kids to struggle with an issue in later life to the detriment of their health. And you're not meant to do that as a parent. And I think that's a much stronger argument that the state should have a role in preventing childhood obesity than I do for adults, because the state has a duty to protect those who can't protect themselves. Healthy school meals is part of that. But clearly there needs to be something more vigorous if we're going to change the fact that 20% of Year 6 children in the UK are now obese. Those kids are going to be dealing with the consequences they had a right to expect that responsible adults would shield them from until they were old enough to take that responsibility for themselves. Anyway, those are some thoughts. There's no reason why it can't be a respectful discussion. What's your take? Think we should be all about keeping life going as long as possible and sacrifice free choice if that's what it takes? Or alternatively, that we make free choices and be allowed to bear the consequences. Let me know in the comments below.